Hello, hello. It's Wednesday. It's nonprofit plug lunch and learn day. <laughs> Hi, Alex. Hi, Brian. Hi. I see Hi. Erica Hi. and Maurice. Adelita. Hi. Hi, Brandy. I'm going to give it another minute or two for folks to come on while we're waiting. Um, Brian, it trips me out every time I see your, uh, photo before you actually turn your video on, Yeah, you have a doppelganger and I'm going to find a photo of him. It's a previous, <laughs> uh, he was a, a CEO of a hospital in, um, uh, in Seattle, Washington. And then he moved to San Diego and was CEO of a hospital down there for the veterans affairs system. Yeah. I swear to God, his doppelganger. Well, I feel sorry for him to have to go through life with that handicap of looking just like <laughs> No, he was so cool. He was the coolest person I ever worked with. He was so cool. Wow, oh, that's awesome. Yeah, send it to me. Yeah. It would be interesting. I meant to tell you that because every time I see that photo, I'm like, Stan? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have any cool milestones, wins, accomplishments. Anybody got, got anything cool to share? I'm going to share one on behalf of somebody I see right now if she doesn't say it. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Adelita, that's what I was going to say. Tell everybody what you uh, accomplished last week because it was pretty major. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> well, well, we'll see in a couple of weeks. The re re uh, responses come out first week of March, but I submitted a uh, two applications for two different nonprofits to be a part of the California State's uh, Trusted Messenger Network. Uh, this is something very new in California, which just came about after the pandemic. I think the state realized that they wanted to have trusted messengers in their network. And so when they need to release very critical time sensitive information, they can do so through those trusted messengers. Um, and so that was my first ever uh, state application doing completely by myself. So thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Sharon Elefan, I should say, uh, for your last minute support. I contacted her like the day before the application was due. So, <laughs> and she came through with all her paperwork and all her advice. And so we got it in luckily. So thank you all so much. Listen, if anyone can sympathize with you, it's Alex and I and, and probably uh, Brian on getting grant applications submitted, and especially when you see a grant application and it's due tomorrow, but you like so perfectly qualify for it and you're going to do everything you possibly can. Like we feel your pain. <laughs> Anybody else have anything that they want to share with the group? Well, I, I like to share that, uh, and this has been an unbelievable challenge. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go as far as to say that we have the secret sauce for the Google Ad Grant Program, but we're trending in well, the right direction. Uh, it's, it's, uh hopefully everyone knows, uh, Google has a program for nonprofits and uh, for their AdWords program. It's uh, And they offer up to $10,000 a month in free advertising. Well, that sounds fantastic until you actually go and try to get it all implemented and actually working. And right now we're trending to use about 3000 of that $10,000. So I, I would consider that wow. a huge win because after the first month and a half or so, we were really floundering with it to the point where we, my, my, uh, my uh, ad AdWord program guy who's well familiar with paid programs. He, he actually accused them of fraud. You know, because we our ads just were not getting served. Mm -hmm. So um it's almost like a fraudulent, it's not all the way fraud in the sense that it's actually fraud, but it feels fraudulent because it's like Google Grants is like, here's ten thousand dollars a month to go do these grants, but they make it almost impossible to actually accomplish and to use yeah. and to actually have it be impactful. It's so cool to hear. This is the first time I've ever heard anything positive. Yeah, I'll keep you updated on it. Okay. Alex, what's uh, up? The uh, most recent numbers is that the average person who um, gets awarded the Google ad grant only spends, um, what is it? Oh, I think it's 300 a month, right? Or something. Yeah. yeah so that's amazing. Congratulations. That's huge. That's awesome. So Brian, we're going to be watching you over the next like six months. I really, really want to see what happens because it's, it, it seems like a really cool opportunity for nonprofits, but it's been so hellacious that it hasn't even been worth it for, for folks to try. So we're counting on you. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to share information as well. You know, once once yeah, it becomes I, more available, specific uh, like a, a roadmap, so to speak. Yeah. You know, yeah. Because you have to, are you guys using kind of like the higher targeted? I mean, part of what's misleading about it is you're like, oh, well, if it's a click, you want, you go for the cheaper ones, which are either at the bottom of the page or the side of the page or not on the page. Has that been part of your strategy to be effective, Brian? Um, I don't quite understand the question. Um, I mean, certainly with paid, you're familiar that they, they are right at the top. So I, I think that we are down on the bottom for uh, our ads. Uh, they certainly do not prioritize free okay. ads, you know, um, and they certainly don't display them anywhere. In other words, if we ran the same campaign and paid, I, I could rest assured that we would be doing really well. So we've had to revamp the ads continuously. Um, and and, and it, it's very com complicated. I mean, you really need somebody that's well familiar with it, you know, from the paid side to even try to navigate the um, the nonprofit side. Yeah, that's what it, that's what it was kind of starting to sound like to me. They they make it seem like it's such a easy process. I know we even tried to do it on our own and still ended up getting charged. And I was like, okay, forget it. We're just going to wait on you, Brian. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you for sharing that because that's actually something that is a positive movement forward with that. So we're really curious to see what happens. Sure. Anybody else have anything they want to share really quick before we dive in today's really fun topic? No. Okay, cool. Um, as usual, y'all know, I like to keep it super informal, ask questions throughout. I'm so excited today. We have Jordan from your mission possible. He comes to us with over 20 years of experience of fundraising and nonprofit leadership and executive experience. So he's going to be, uh, diving into that today. As we continue to bring on more and more resources for everyone, we want to be able to share, as many different opportunities as we can to bring in funding to organizations and not just rely um, on grants that are very hard to get. Um, if you're new, you know, you might be nervous about donor cultivation. So we'll talk about some of that stuff today. So Jordan, I did the worst possible intro ever. If you could give us a brief overview of who you are, your experience, your mission possible, and then let's dive in right into the bulk of the topic. And um, those of you, if you have questions, just ask them or you can put it in the chat and I'll monitor the chat and ask on your behalf. But Jordan, the floor is yours. Yeah, great. Well, super excited to be here and to meet everybody. Um, it's always, you know, I'm one of the the peculiar people that like to talk about fundraising. I think most people don't like to talk about it, which is part of the problem. Uh, but I've been in the nonprofit sector for about 20 years now. Um, started my career working as like a volunteer manager at a soup kitchen um, back in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and immediately somebody was like, you would be really good in fundraising. And I, and I had never even really considered working in nonprofit fundraising or working in development. I didn't even know what development was at that point or what that meant. Um, and so started my career there. Um, basically, you know, Rave was able to increase their budget at the organization like 20 or 30 percent really early on. Um, and then I guess, you know, as a lot of people in this call might or might not know, there's like this fun little revolving door of fundraising in the nonprofit sector, where if you find some modicum of success somewhere, it is very easy to kind of ride the ladder and kind of go through to different organizations, get the promotions, kind of use that budget. And so um, in the process of doing all that, I kind of learned what was what is somewhat broken in our nonprofit sector around fundraising in particular, which is that we don't really understand what makes fundraising developer development experts successful in what they're doing. And people are often hiring off of the resume, which is often built off the backs of your board, of a long-term grant connection that you've already had, like things that actually the development director or development manager that you're hiring isn't even really being relevant to in, in particular. So I started a consulting firm um, that tried to put, bring a team together of people that were experts in like specific areas. So I do most of my work in individual giving, strategic planning. But then we have somebody that we call her our train conductor. She keeps all of our administrative things running on time and makes sure that everything that needs to be filed and all those things are done appropriately. We have an events person. We have a graphics design and web person. Um, and then we have a writer. And so all of those people are doing very critical and important things to the fundraising process. But each of those are a completely different skill set. And each one of those people on our team and you'll see this if, as you scroll down, um, three of them have the same name. They're all named Emily, but they are, I promise, very different people with very different skill sets. That's how you have to be, um, that's what you're looking for in a good fundraising person, somebody that has this diversity of skill sets and there aren't enough good, diverse people 
Um, I am terrible at the administrative stuff. I am terrible at graphic design. Um, and so, you know, at the end of the day, everybody's job ends up focusing on that one person's kind of what, the thing that they're not great at. So what what we're trying to do now is turn that those skill sets that we've developed together as a team into a broader technology um, and one that it kind of combines the pre-work that you need to do on all these areas. So we're, we're creating a new technology called Blueprint. Um, which is a project management tool. So every time you want to do something with fundraising, if you're using our system, you can go into the system and you can say, I want to start my run or walk. Um, and it gives you the 38 steps that you need to go through for the run or walk. And every one of those has a template and a pre-design and a pre-part of that built out because we've done seven of those already. And so we know all the kind of stuff that needs to be done on the front end, hopefully alleviating time for people on the back end. So we can talk about some of the fun things um, about fundraising and, and where the work really needs to be done. So the focus of today's webinar is really going to be on that individual giving portion of fundraising. I'm talking a little about, I know uh, Sharon told me that you guys have done a lot of conversations around grants and that piece. So we're going to talk a little bit about what the diversification looks like on that and where some of the focus for you guys needs to be um, and kind of how to think about that. And I'm, I'm going to, you know, one of the things that, and I'm going to share my screen because I've got a little presentation here. Um, one of the things that, you know, we know of all the time when we, when we think about fundraising overall really is this concept of the challenges and the vulnerability of fundraising. You hear about all the successes and I love celebrating people's successes. And it's great that we start calls like these talking about where people have been successful. Um, but the fundraising world is one where you live in a space that probably like 60 to 80% of the time you actually don't get the thing that you want out of what you're asking for. Now, that doesn't always mean you've been given a no, but like if you wanted to get $500 from somebody and you ask them and they say, I can only give 100, that's that's getting 20% of what you just asked for, right? And you probably put a lot of time and preparation into that. And, and then you have to kind of walk away from that experience having been told no or having been told you aren't going to be able, I'm not able to do this right now or whatever that might look like. So I want to talk a little bit about recognizing what those challenges look like, how to work through those, how to think about those, and how to turn some of those challenges in those moments into assets of things that you can move forward as as you're moving along as well. Um, so we're going to just keep moving along here. I did already did my introduction overall here. Um, so the first thing that I will say, and you'll hear this a million times, and on our platform on Blueprint, we have little tra like training videos on nearly every task. Um, that tell you some different things to think about. One of the things that we're constantly saying is the idea of people give to people. And this is the most fundamental thing that everybody has to remember about fundraising. You, you are often thinking about it as your organization, the program work that you're doing, the mission that you're trying to accomplish, um, the grant application that you've been writing, the technical whatever, the program budget that I had to work on, all of those things. And it is not to say that those things don't matter. Um, but at the end of the day, the thing that you have to remember is that everybody is looking at this from a people perspective. Um, you're engaging with a program manager. You're engaging with a committee of people that are analyzing your grant application. You're making an ask that's going directly to another person. And so it's really easy to get lost in the sauce of all of those other things that are happening in front of you. And we're really trying to try and make people remember that the first rule about all of this is that there's a person on the other side of this. And that if you're appealing to kind of that person as a person and you're working around building a connection with that person first and foremost, and, they, and that, this can be in any iteration. This can be as a sponsor from a corporate company. This can be as a grant application. This can be as an individual donor. You've got to remember that they're people first um, and that spending that time and that effort of recognizing them as a person is going to pay dividends for you down, down all the way down the road. Um, I saw a really good post on LinkedIn this week of somebody that was talking about Valentine's Day. Great day to ask for money, right? You know, you have kind of the setting of people wanting to give back, caring about each other. It's the right universe. And this guy's talking about how he received an email from an organization that he hadn't given, yeah, had gave money to last year. He hadn't heard back from them and had no engagement with them for 18 months. And now he has an email in his inbox asking them to give him money, right? So think about that if, if you're in this a person to person engagement, right? Like even if you are, you know, it's your kid that you're giving an allowance to, or, you know, you were the kid asking for an allowance and like, you know, you, you don't see your parents all week and then you come back and you're like, oh, hey, I need $20. Well, you're way likely to get less likely to get that. Remember it in kind of that context as you're thinking about it, but also remember it in the ways that you think about trying to remember, you know, the people in your lives that are important to you. You know, I was at dinner last night with a friend and we were talking about somebody starting a new job. And I remembered that a close friend of mine just started a new job. And I sent him a text and I said, hey, how's been everything? How has everything been going with that? 
Um, that same approach is one that you need to apply to donors. You need to apply to program managers. You need to apply to corporate sponsors and connections. Because if you build that good core person-to-person -person connection, then you're going to get everything that you're going to get the most that you can out of that relationship with that person. <clears throat> so the second area that we talk about then is really then, okay, now I've developed this relationship with somebody. Where should I be talking about? How should I be focusing that? Um, passion, vision, and impact are the areas that we're always pushing people towards. Remember to always be kind of carving what you're talking about and the context of, of how you're talking about that around those areas. People are incredibly responsive. Think about the people that you are responsive to in your life, the people that are passionate about the things that they're doing, that, show, that are showing you how much they care about that. Those are the ones that you're, you're responsive to. The businesses that you want to be involved in are the ones that make sense, that they can lay out their vision of what they're trying to accomplish and how they're going to get there. Um, and the impact, the ones that make a difference, the places that have good food or the restaurants you go to. Um, it's the same idea in the nonprofit sector. The organizations that are making a big difference in their community and that's being communicated to them, those are the areas that you're going to be most effective. Um, so then the other key is then learning to be good at storytelling. And for some people, that's, you know, if you're not an extrovert, um, that's okay, but you have to learn what your strengths are in terms of being able to tell a story, how to identify what you've been effective with. Um, and I recommend, you know, if there's anywhere I would recommend spending time, it would not be on multiple webinars like this one, because you're going to hear what all the principles that I'm talking about here, you will hear in any fundraising session. Um, improving your ability to talk about storytelling, improving your ability to be able to articulate your passion, vision, and impact in terms of what you're doing. Those are going to those are going to be able to be places that you are, are really spending your time well. So if you feel like you need to go and watch webinars about how to be better at storytelling, how to be better at public speaking, really encourage kind of those areas and then spend time with your team, spend time with your clients, articulating those stories and those that vision of who you are that happens internally. And that might be with your board, that might be with your family, that might be with your organization, depending on your size and scope. But you want to hone that internally. Take the time that you might think that you're spending on a webinar in that place, just talking with the people that care about what you're doing for an hour about why it's important, why they think those things are important. Take notes about those and make sure that you're sharing those things along the way. Um, and the culmination of all this stems in this idea of relationships. You want to be building relationships with whoever your donors are in this process, whatever that looks like. At the end of the day, those relationships are going to tell you the thing you need to know. Um, and the, the kind of lasting thing that we want people to remember is that in relationships, like any relationship that anybody here has probably been in with their kids, with a significant other, with your parents, all good relationships are built on the foundation of good communication. And I don't mean that in the communication like development sense. I want you to think about that with your donors of relationships with them as other people in your lives, right? So if I want something from someone or they want something from me, we have to communicate about what that looks like. So if your donor is looking for certain things, you can ask them. So let's say you are going to a corporate sponsor and they're, they're expressing some interest between your bronze and silver package. You can go back to them. You don't have to try and get them to just be the silver. Obviously, we want them to be silver and not bronze. But you can go back to them and say something along the lines of, hey, what, what are you looking for here, right? Like, like, do you want your name in our email newsletters or do you want your name on a banner? Or is there something completely different on here that you think is a bene is beneficial to you in terms of this partnership? Why are you giving money? When do you want us to approach you? How should we stay in contact with each other? All of these are reasonable questions that you can ask your donors or the, your friends or people that you've built relationships with in that process. We really encourage you to keep notes about those kind of things. Those are, and I know every your CRMs are important, how you're tracking, you know, whether it's in an Excel sheet, how you're tracking and making sure you're following up and thank yous. Those things are important, but kind of how you want to stay in touch with someone, whether they love dogs, you know, the things that you can talk to them about and make sure that you build that connection with them. Those are really important ones for you to make sure that you're building as part of this relationship process. At the end of the day, those are going to be the foundation to you feeling comfortable and feeling ready to make an ask to somebody in some of these instances, because that's the other part of this. If you don't have a relationship with someone, it's much more difficult. It's like going in. It's like being on Shark Tank. Like if you have to go in front of a group of people that you've never met before and ask them money, that is going to make you sweat a lot more than if you're going to somebody that already understands you, already knows what you're doing, already has a relationship with you. That person is a much easier person to approach in the process. So we want people to think about donors as people, corporate sponsors as people, grant makers as people. If you can do that as the first step in your process, it's going to be really helpful for you. So the next thing that we really recommend, and this, this one I think is also critical, is that 
everybody wants to help you. Um, and I, I think that is almost always true. And it doesn't matter what it is that you're approaching to them, approaching them about people at their core want to help other people that they know or that they've been connected to. Um, and so the example I'll use is we've built out our technology blueprint. I've been kind of going out to my network, talking to them about what we're trying to do and create. And voluntarily, people that I didn't expect are like, oh, well, you should talk to these three or four people. I, I connected with a former coworker. We used to work uh, at a disability organization where I was the executive director. She was our program officer, part-time program officer for this one conference thing. And I found out she worked at this kind of tech startup generator group. And so I, I called her and I just told her about what was going on. And she's like, oh, you got to talk to these three other people that I work with. Well, those three other people connected me with seven other people that I needed to talk to. Four of them were executive directors of organizations. Three of them were program managers at community foundations or grant give, grant making foundations in the Milwaukee area. Now, granted, they're all in Milwaukee because that's where their network is. But this all stemmed from me just having one conversation with one person. And I got all the way to a multi, like a, a nine digit foundation program manager from that one initial conversation. So what does that mean? And why, you know, why is this not just me making a, a brag to all of you? What that Jordan, ultimately quickie, qu quickie question. So sorry, uh, I want to grab yeah. Adelita before she loses her, her thought. If she's if she's anything like me, Adelita, go ahead and ask. <laughs> oh, thank you. I don't want to interrupt Jordan. I'm like I, I like no, it. That's okay. I, inter I interrupted him for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but on the previous slide, so so you had you know like the series of things you should be doing. Uh, one of the things is storytelling. Um, how do you do storytelling? Um, like I understand what storytelling is, but you know when you've been, for example, in operations for four years now, and you're meeting with a new person, how do you tell your story? Do you you know at every meeting? Should you have it on your website? Should you be sending out newsletters? I mean, the answer to that is all of the above. So any places that any place that you can insert something that would be effective storytelling for what your mission is, you should always be trying to kind of place that into those spots. The way that I really encourage people to think about storytelling is to try and think about it from a client perspective. I think especially mentioning like being on the operations side, it gets really easy. And especially for any of you guys that are in the executive role of running your organization, you're filing your paperwork, you're doing your books, you're running your payroll, you're doing all these other things that have nothing to do with the mission of your organization. Making sure that you're trying to tie back to who those clients are is really critical for you for whatever you're doing within the organization. Because if you if you're doing that once a month, you will naturally find the places that it's appropriate to bring up those clients and those stories and the other conversations that you're having. So you know your program managers that are doing the on the ground work are always kind of really being able to connect those. But making sure that you're pulling out really effective client based stories in the work that you're doing and making sure your whole team can see and feel and communicate what that is, I think that's the bottom line strength of storytelling we're looking at. Now you do that effectively with your communications manager, and maybe this is all you, right? Like everybody, everybody's organizations are different sizes. A lot of a lot of these shops, just like the development people that I mentioned earlier, are all one on one individuals, right? Um, maybe that's you. But then when you're thinking about communications, okay, how do I insert this story here? Oh, I'm now I'm an in individual donors. How do I think about it here? Now I'm on our website. How do I think about it here? Um, but making sure that you you are finding the heart of the story and the work that you're doing. And making sure that you communicate that people never that's one of those examples of things that people will never get tired of hearing about um that are within your network does that answer your question yeah okay any Thank other question i'm a i'm a fast and rapid talker so i can a <laughs> slow down if that needs to happen but i can also take any other questions right now if someone has one okay i'm gonna jump back into this concept of like everybody wanting to help. So, you know, the idea is that, you know, people, once they hear what you're doing, they hear the passion or the expertise behind what you're doing. If there's a way for them to plug in and help you, and, it, and it's one that fits within their personality and who they're doing, they're going to volunteer whatever that is. Um, and the last slide that I get to, I'm going to kind of tie all of that home. But this idea is that people, when they, when they connect with you, just naturally want to find ways to help you. They want to think about ways to help you as you're telling them what you're doing. Now, some of that might be advice that you don't want. <laughs> it might be them telling you, well, why don't you try this? I mean, how, like we've all been in one of those conversations where you're explaining the mission of the organization of what you're doing. And somebody's like, you know, you guys should really try this, right? Or uh, 
have you guys thought of like reaching out to like Bill Gates or Oprah? Like there, there are all kinds of people that have all kinds of advice about those things, but people feel good about trying to help and contribute in those ways. And so for every six people that might tell you, hey, reach out to the Doheny Foundation if you're in the Los Angeles area, of course, you know, I would love to know the Dohenies. If I knew the Dohenies, I probably wouldn't, you know, necessarily needing to be having this conversation. But for every six of those examples, there are probably one or two people that are going to help you get connected to somebody that can really make a difference. Um, and so smiling and nodding your way through some of the challenging advice that you might have to hear, you're going to get all kinds of advice about all kinds of different things. But there are lots of diamonds in the rough amongst all of those things that happen in that direct one-on-one -on -one connections. So whether those are through coffee, whether those are through Zoom meetings, whether it's through text messages or emails, whatever that looks like, the most important thing is making the ask. That you have to set people up and you have to be really clear about what it is that you're asking for, right? Because if the goal of this webinar was to just talk about, uh, that, this is a bad, I'm trying to think of a better example. If you're going to a donor and you just have coffee with them and they don't know that you're going to ask them for money and you never directly make the ask and you walk away from that coffee and you're like, well, gee, I didn't get a donation. How can you be surprised that that's been the result of what you're getting? So if you're talking to someone and there's a person in their LinkedIn network that you want to get to. So, for example, we're trying to build a connection to the, now, uh, the California Nonprofit Association. There are two people that are in my network on LinkedIn that both know the executive director at that organization. Right. So if I start texting with those two people. Um, which I've done, and I never asked them to connect me to that other person. How could I? How could I have ever expect them to know that? So we apply the same thing to whatever it is that you're doing with the donors or the supporters that you're working with. Think of them as people. Think of it as relationship building. But along the way, make sure that you tell them what it is that you want to get from this conversation, what it is that it can be, how they can help you. Um, and remember that sometimes you're going to make an ask like that, and they're going to say no. You know, in my examples. Right. Maybe I reach out to my person and, and he was like, well, I connected to him on LinkedIn. So one person told me I connected to him because I met him at a conference, but I don't actually know him. And I've never had a conversation with him before. OK, that that wasn't you know, that was a no. No, I can't connect you to this person. But it wasn't a no. Geez, you shouldn't be talking to that person, that person in the first place. Alex, did you have a question? I'm going to try to be better at noticing this now. <laughs> Here we are. I was just curious, um, like. How frequently do you get people initiated as volunteers first and then build the relationship that way so that they're maybe more likely to give? Like, how frequently do you think that should be? I mean, so this, this, that's a really good question. It depends on the type of organization you are and the type of volunteers that you're bringing in and what that looks like. Obviously, a lot of people kind of use the high school volunteer model. They're bringing people in that are like, you know, doing volunteering for hours. But if you have people that are coming in and volunteering true to your mission, it is absolutely a missed opportunity for a lot of people to think, oh, well, I have a volunteer. They can't be a donor. Like they, they like build this like invisible barrier between them and they think, well, I can never ask them for money because if I ask them to make a donation, then they're not going to volunteer anymore. And that that is that relationship doesn't really exist. And, and we would encourage people to think about it the other way around as well. Don't think of your donors as people that can't volunteer as well. People, the closer you can get people to your mission, the better. Um, you know, one of the things that we encourage people to do with donors is invite them to come in for a tour, invite them to come and see your space, set up this framework of how much you think an individual do major major donor is, what that is to you. So maybe you maybe you only get five thousand dollars of donations a year. So a three hundred and fifty dollar donor is important to you. Invite that person to come and do some work with you for the day, or see what you're doing, or meet a client, get them in at the ground level. In the same sense, volunteers know your work, they know your mission, they know your impact better than anybody. Um, and so asking those people to participate in your giving programs, I we absolutely 100% encourage it. I have never heard of a volunteer that stopped volunteering somewhere because they were asked for money, right? I think that we all live in a very reasonable world where we all understand kind of how all these things are driven that, you know, as said by Mother Teresa, no money, no mission. Um, so it's not that we're asking you for money because we're putting down anything else that you're doing. We're doing it because we have to stay open and it's the only way we can stay in business. Um, so obviously don't be aggressive about it. And I would say the same thing about anything with donors, you know, you really don't want to be asking anybody for something more than two to three times a year. Um, anything more than that is too much. And it's the same way with volunteers. As long as you are, as, as part of your regular communication cycle, you're treating them like people in that process. Um, there's really no reason not to think about 
um, ways to be engaging volunteers as potential donors. Um, so in terms of connections, you know, remembering that you're allowed to communicate with them about finding things out about them. You're allowed to ask people what time of year they want to give money. And so I'm, a lot of people, that doesn't make sense to them, right? You know, if, and if you haven't been in the nonprofit space for long, you're like, oh, well, you usually ask people for money around the end of the year. That makes a lot of sense. Thanksgiving time, end of year giving, Christmas time. Um, but simultaneously, a lot of people are actually setting up what they want to do around April 15th on tax day for a lot of major donors. They're deciding what they want to do with their donor advised funds around that time of year. So they might not be writing you the check on April 15th, but they want you to make the ask around April 15th so they can plan for it, so they can adjust in their taxes, they can make whatever those decisions are. Some people don't want to be bothered with it by, at the end of the year. There are a lot of other things going wrong. There are a lot of emails. There are a lot of things that are happening. They want to be asked in September. They want to be. They want to have a conversation with you about it in February. There's nothing wrong with you approaching a donor and asking them how they want to be engaged with you. Again, it's the same idea that good relationships are built on good communication. Um, don't be afraid of those situations. You know, in a lot of cases, those people are going to say, whenever you need to ask or whenever it fits for you, that's the right time to ask. But some people are going to be a lot more specific about it. Um, and for some donors that do work in business where they are bonus driven or like specific quarters are their best quarters, in a lot of cases, they're going to tell you that. They're going to say, hey, the second quarter is when we set our marketing budget. That's when you need to make sure that you get your sponsorship ask in, right? And so maybe you, you're you doing your event in October, but you're building your sponsorship package in June, but you know that I need to get an ask in front of this guy in April because that's when, if I ask him in June, they're going to have spent all their money already, right? So making sure that you go out of your way for those times to be appropriate, you've got to make sure that you, you're kind of connecting on that level with them finding out that information. Again, these are the critical things to store, uh, information to store about donors. In our project management tool, we build a specific note section for these kind of things. And it's different than kind of like your razor's edge, boomerang, donor doc, little green, little green dot, light. I can't remember what, which one. <laughs> there are all these CRMs that you're tracking the actual donations and the gifts, and those are important. Um, but but these things, the things that are the, the subtle things that can go a really long way with donors, we want there to be a space for that, and we want that to be a thing that the individuals are thinking about as they're approaching donors one on one. So we want to talk about a little challenges around starting your individual donor program because I know that you know as Sharon told me there are all kinds of shapes and sizes of nonprofits that are listening to this, attending this, and for some people you're completely grant funded up to this point. You are completely board funded. You're completely government contract funded. I know that the event that I met Sharon at, we heard from an organ, I met with an organization there. They said, yeah, we get 95% of our money, um, you know, from the county, you know, and we do this on a fee for service basis and it's great for us, but we're worried that what are their cuts one year in terms of what the county is doing? What if we want to do other programs? How do we get something like that started? Um, and so again, in this, in the context of what challenges might look like. The first thing to think about and vulnerability, the first thing to think about is that your individual donor program is probably not one that's going to pay off immediately. Um, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It could happen tomorrow. So don't rule it out. You never know what's going to happen. Um, but it's probably one that's going to need to take time to develop. Um, again, especially if you're starting this time of year, oh, I think what 62% of money is given in the fourth quarter of every year, because that's when it's just timely in terms of what's happening. So you want to think about where the money is coming in, why it's coming in during those times, how it's going to be contributed in that way. Um, think about your timeline and think about the time investment that you're going to have to put into this. Um, you know, in the way that we think about how you build friendships, right? Over time, it starts out slower. <laughs> you're going out to get drinks at first, maybe dinner. You know, maybe you're going to an activity with them. It's not doing all these things all at once. Um, as you develop your relationship, that's when you get into a position to be able to make that ask and be able to do those kind of things. You don't want to just be coming to everybody always right up front and saying, hey, can you write me a check? Hey, I need a donation. Hey, whatever that is. You want to lay the groundwork that they're going to hear from you a couple times a year. And when they hear from you during that time, you're not going to be asking them for money. This is a thousand percent critical to how you engage with your donors. Every time they hear from you and every email communication they get, every experience they have with you, Cannot be you asking them for money or that that donor will burn out in a hurry. They'll stop taking your calls. They'll stop talking to you and they're not going to engage with you anymore. The trade-off is that it takes time to develop those things. And it takes time to figure it out. The other reason timeline can be lengthy is because you don't know who you're, is in your network right away. 
and you have to start reaching out to everybody. So I, the same event that I was at with Sharon, um, when she was speaking, we had uh, an individual there who asked the question, you know, he's like, we're, we're having trouble. We might not be able to make payroll next month. How do we do this? And Sharon's advice was make everybody on your board, give a list of 50 people, make them email or call every single person on that list and ask them to give $50. Right. And it's the same idea, but the, that, Again, timeline matters. If you need to, every person on your board to put a list of 50 people together, and I don't know, I don't know if you all are working with boards that are uh, magically better than the boards that I've worked with historically, but if I ask my board to make a list of 50 people each, it probably takes me six weeks and a lot of individual babysitting and following up individually with each one of those board members to get them to make that list of 50 people in the first place. That's not even getting them to send the emails. It's not even getting them to make the calls. All these things factor into the time that you need to build, but you have to develop the muscles with yourself and with your team to think about it this way, right? So this idea that when I'm when I am building my list of people, when I am, I've got my stack of business cards from all the events and things that I go to that I keep right on my desk, right? Is this idea that I have to keep the frame of mind that I'm thinking about how I'm going to engage with my donors, who those people are, and how I'm following up with them in those processes. Again, that's a, that's a developed process personally. You have to strengthen that muscle first. And then once you've done that with yourself and with your board, you can be a lot more effective with fundraising. Um, the second thing that we talk about in terms of challenges is the, the contributions that you get initially also might not necessarily be monetary. And this kind of goes back to the idea of what I was talking about earlier, where you're gonna get a lot of advice and you're gonna hear a lot of things from a lot of people that you may not even care to hear in the first place, <laughs> but you are gonna get some things that are really valuable. You're going to get connections to other people that are really valuable, and you're going to be spending time building and developing relationships with the individuals that you need later on. And so thinking about that as an investment of kind of growing a plant or like taking something from a seed level, you've got to water it, you've got to pay attention to it, you've got to cultivate it in the process before it's going, it's not just going to be a flower tomorrow. And so we want you to think about what that looks like in the same way that you're growing a flower when when the stem finally comes out of the ground, that's an exciting moment, right? Like the time a donor reaches out directly to you and says something to you, now you know you've got them, right? Now you know that they're involved in your mission, they care about what you're doing, they're prepped and cultivated to take the next step of, of what you wanna do in that process. Jordan, can you give us an example from back in the days when you were an executive director and maybe two examples, one of a really positive experience of like a, a donor ask in the cultivation process, what that looked like, and then maybe like a really horrific one, just so we can kind of see what both looked like? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, I have lots of, you know, the success story, the, the general success story that you're hoping to operate at is this idea that you've been made an introduction to somebody. So somebody connected me to like basically a former C-level person um, at Verizon. He had kind of retired, uh, started his own consulting practice. He was doing work within the space that we were doing. Um, he, so I was working with the National Down Syndrome Congress as their executive director. Um, he had a daughter with Down syndrome. They had kind of fallen out of the community at large and out of the space. Um, obviously, I'm based here in Los Angeles. It was a national organization. I was in the New York area with friends for a weekend and stayed an extra day, had dinner with him in New York City, um, where I picked up the tab for dinner. We had, he's a foodie, I'm a foodie. We had a really good conversation, a really good experience. Followed up with him a couple months later. Um, he was really excited about the vision and the direction the organization was taking. We waited another six months before we got to the end of the year and then asked him to be um, a five-digit supporter of our gala and they came in as a $50,000 sponsor. So that's an example where you start out at a small level, it's just dinner, it's just engaging with them, it's follow-ups about what the organization is doing, it's about learning him, it was about learning about his daughter, it was about learning about their experience. She was having challenges with her school, um, so they ultimately ended up changing schools. So I, because of my work in the disability space, I had I have some understanding of IEPs um, in 504 and how some of those things work, and so I was able to have that conversation with him. And so as those things develop in that process, we showed him what our expertise was, how the value of that was, and what that looked like. And we were able to turn that into something really successful. Um, so an example of, of how you can lead up to doing this directly, and then how you have to be careful about what some of these things are, is that I was working with another client running a capital campaign. Um, and they used to be located really close to USC. And so in this process, a very famous film director did his like film internship with them when he was in college. Um, and I'm not going to talk about who it is specifically, but basically they had to do like video interviews as like part of what they were doing for their mission. 
And so this film director basically did all his early film work on site with them and their clients, um, and therefore had a really big affinity and attachment to what they were doing. So this organization is building a new building. We're in the middle of a capital campaign working for them. We, we build this guy up, we get him in, we take him on the tour, we sit him down. And the thing about making your ask is the one thing you need to know is you make your ask and then you stop talking, right? So, so we were going to ask him for a five-year, $500,000 commitment um, to go towards completing this building. Um, we made the ask and everybody in the room in that moment was coached. Will you, will you make this $500,000 commitment? And he says, yeah, I think I want to do that. Um, we said, great, we'll follow up with you. He's like, I wasn't there the next day in the office. His manager called in and the manager was like, I'm not sure that we can do this. And the COO of the organization was like, well, we'll take $50,000, which is fundamentally against the rules of what we talked about before that, which is that you make the ask, it's clear, you leave it and you stick with that. And so of course, after the individual had con committed to this $500,000, and his business manager can get off the hook for 50, he's gonna say yes, he wrote the check immediately. The COO was thrilled because they get it. it's the first time that she had ever gotten a five digit check. Um, but, but to me, we have just lost $450,000. Because in that instance, you say, well, you know, Ryan or you know whoever really wanted to make this $500,000 commitment, why don't we get him on the phone first, right? Like you never wanna be like dealing with somebody in the intermediary of all those things. And so we ended up walking away from that where a huge loss in terms of the relationship overall and a huge loss in terms of the contribution. There was a lot less that we were able to do with him after that as a result of that. Um, so you want to be really careful about how you kind of manage these relationships. And, and you certainly, that's why we talk about this idea of making the ask and sticking with it. Because if you don't do that kind of in the context of some of these processes, donors are, donors are going to walk away from you in the process. So some of the other Oh, the other challenges that you're going to be told now. I, that, you know, I didn't give any, there are plenty of times that I've gone through that exact same process of having dinner with someone, building a connection with them, having a relationship with them, getting to the end of the year, knowing what we think the opportunity is to ask them for money, asking them for money, and then them basically being like, yeah, no, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> and so you just have to live through that process. You have to kind of smile. You have to understand that that's the way things work that people have all kinds of different financial struggles and challenges in the same way that even if somebody has a lot of money and you know they have capacity, in the same way that you might decide not to give to your friends kind of GoFundMe for their kid that needs something important or somebody else that you see, there are all kinds of amazing causes that come across all of our desks all the time. And so it's really important to remember that there are all kinds of reasons why people don't give. You can't take it personally. You have to kind of have a little bit of a, a, a zen approach to what those things are. Don't be afraid to ask for money a second time from someone that's told you, no, I'm not able to do that right now. You could say something like, I know you weren't able to give last year. Has that dynamic changed for you this year? You have to be able to go back to the well. You have to be able to live with kind of the rejection of that process. And you have to be able to kind of let it roll off your back. Um, because at the end of the day, the one thing I always try and remind folks of that, that are making these asks is that you're doing this for the reasons why this is important to you. You're doing this for the, your clients, you're doing this for your community. You're doing this for your mission. If that's your family or whatever that is, whatever that is meaningful to you, that's the reason you're doing this. And so if people are saying no to that, they're not saying no to the people you're serving. They're just saying, no, my resources and my things are in other places in that process. Um, so the benefits to an individual giving program obviously are money. Anytime you can are raising money, that's obviously a positive. But one of the things we talk about is good donor engagement is Increased awareness for you, right? So think about it like this. If you are a significant donor to an organization, you're probably sharing or liking things in terms of social media of what they're doing. You're probably talking to your family or talking to your friends about what you're doing. If you are able to get them down for a tour or you're able to get them on site for something, they're probably talking to somebody else about what that looks like in the process. The, the steps that you do use to build a relationship with these individual donors are going to reverberate and pay dividends for you. I talked about how I took one call that I have with a former coworker of something completely unconnected to the work that we're doing leads to a really valuable conversation for us down the road. You've got to think about those other potential benefits for you in the process of that and where you're going to be able to kind of cultivate and grow those opportunities. Um, unrestricted funds is a huge one. Um, you know, grants are going to tie up what you need to be doing and where those things are. 
how you have to manage that money, the capacity that you need for some of those things. Sometimes you want to just raise a couple thousand dollars so you can run a lunch program on a certain day for a certain thing that you know that's going on. You know, Women's History Month is coming up. There's an amazing girls, you know, there's a girls soccer program that's supposed to happen, but no one's giving them lunch. So no one's signing up. Like we got to go get $2,000 to, to make sure that we're giving them lunch. Well, the timing of a grant, the effectiveness of a grant, tracking, reporting, doing all those things with that, it might, it, you might get the $2,000, then you might do $5,000 of work on the other side. Um, so this is, you know, individual giving allows you to be flexible. It means people are buying into your mission and they're buying into you as a leader. Um, that's why those funds are unrestricted. It's not just saying yes to whatever it is you're doing. It's saying yes to you, saying yes to the leadership of your organization. And I, I you know, I've talked a lot about networks and connections and where there are other values there um, for you as well. So we love our little isms, um, to quote Ferris Bueller, uh, <laughs> your mission possible. And so one of the ones that we like to say is after money, get advice, after advice, get money. And it really is just kind of a transitive concept around the same thing of building relationships with people first. This idea that if the first thing that you're doing with somebody is asking them money, they're, they're not going to return on you know, your investment in that sense. Um, obviously, they can't even be invested in it from that perspective. And so we kind of talk a little bit about what that cycle looks like for us. One, we've talked a lot about how you treat donors as people. Two, this idea of sharing your journey. This is the, And this is the advice, asking for advice to get money idea, is that you're getting buy-in around your concept of whatever it is that you're doing. And so this could be your mission. This could be how you're implementing a program. This could be how you're building capacity within your organization. It could be how you're building your board. It could be how whatever the next thing is that you need to tackle that you're looking for partnership or help or support on, including people into that, they're going to be invested in this. And so this is the whole idea of you know treating donations like investments and not treating them like charity. I'm not asking you to give me money because you feel bad for me, because you feel bad for my clients. I'm asking you to give me money because you think that our community the people that we're serving, the people that we're working with are going to be better for it in this process. And we're all going to be better off at doing whatever that is by working on that together. Was there a question, Adelisa? Yep, uh, it was, uh, I think, related to the previous slide. Um, in terms of like when you're asking for donations, like that example you gave, you know, somebody thought 50,000 is really good where it was not good because we could have gone 500,000. How do you gauge uh, like per individual, per network, per person, per company, what they can do and where you should land? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, I mean, in this instance, we were running a capital campaign and there's some, some, uh, some, some sophisticated, that's a tongue pull, some sophisticated tools that you can use to gauge genuine capacity on individuals, especially if you're looking for high value gifts. In this example, what we were talking about, we were talking about a film or a film director slash producer that had just we were aware of through the public knowledge signed on to a very lucrative series of movies that he was making on top of that, and we knew that he had just signed a nine digit contract. So asking him for five hundred thousand dollars was literally nothing. So one is know your donors, know things about them, try and do a little bit of research about who they are and where they work. If they are if they are a local manager at your Bank of America versus a senior director at Goldman Sachs, that tells you something, right? The senior director at Goldman Sachs is probably making, and not that bank managers don't make good money, probably making eight, 10, 12 times what a bank manager is making. Just keep those things in your frame of mind as, as you're doing those. Then you can apply some of these tools that I've talked about. There are organizations called like, um, we use Donor Search, uh, Web Wealth Engine is another one. There basic, there's a basically public information databases out there that you can get access to if you're at that level. The way we stratify that and recommend people kind of take a look and work on those things is if you're really in a budget range of trying to get individual gifts of over $10,000 or more, then you want to start to look at programs like that. If you're not asking people consistently for $10,000 gifts or more, you really should kind of ratchet that down. On the corporate side, we'd recommend you take a look at how else they're supporting other organizations. Now, the two things to remember are one, everybody has their favorite pet organizations. So um, think about board members and executive leadership and, and make sure you're sensitive to whoever that is. So like if you're, if you're looking at like, like say, I'm just going to make something up, Ralph's, because there's a Ralph's down the street here. Um, and they're sponsoring, you know, the local nonprofit, the local art gallery down here in the street for me for $50,000. I'm just making something up. But 
the person on the art gallery board is a senior VP at Ralph's, then don't expect that you're going to get $50,000 from Ralph's. Well, all the other sponsorships that Ralph's giving out are all between $2,500 and $5,000. That's really, that's really where you should be like falling in. Um, especially on the corporate side, they're often looking specifically for kind of the publicity that comes with that. So just narrowing that down and looking for other people that are supporting or they are supporting and the levels that they're supporting at are the ask that you want to give. Um, and then at the end of the day, a lot of people are going to lead you into the areas that they can give. So if you have the capacity to give $500, you're often going to give closer to $500 than like $5, for example. And so you want to take your cues from your donor um, in terms of the capacity. This is one of those instances where I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> there are a lot of things you can ask your donor about. How do you want to be engaged? What can we do for you? How often do you want to hear from us? Do you want to get coffee? Do you want to, do you like doing Zooms? Do you prefer text or phone calls? Those are all reasonable questions. Don't ask your donor what their capacity is. Um, that, that, will never, that will never go over well for you in terms of that process. And so often just sliding them up is the scale. You know, if you, they're coming in initially at $100 and you think that just from a general sense of who they are, the car they drive, your engagement with them, they can move to 250 ask them for 250 If they stay at $100, make note of that and just keep your ass in that regard. If you move them up to 250 then maybe you can consider moving up to 500 You get to 500 maybe you can move up to 1000 If you're in a higher scale, then taking a look at whether or not you want to try and run some kind of well screening on them. You know, people's houses are public record. There are all kinds of public record information about people. So you can find out kind of their capacities in, in all kinds of different ways. Those are those are kind of deep dive development practices of much more significant size and budgeted organizations where you really dive into kind of what those folks are doing. The other public record that you can find is um, political contributions. Um, and I will warn people for this year, this is we are heading into an election year is going to be an expensive election year. Um, it would not be surprising for me to hear from people that are typically getting stronger donations from individuals to see potentially less than that. Um, you know, Biden is in LA right now and there are gonna be major dinners hosted at 4,500 plus a pop for plates at those dinners. Those are gonna affect the philanthropy of other people's ability to give. That being said, people will cue you what their philanthropy ability is based on kind of what they're able to do from often from uh, a political perspective as well. So that was a super long answer. <laughs> um, so yeah, so thinking about, um, just jumping back to our cycle, thinking about involving people in your investment and involving people in what you're doing. You want them to feel like they're part of what it is that you have going on. The reason you ask for that advice is because you want them to feel like they've contributed you have to find ways to either integrate people's advice or make it feel as though their advice has been heard in that process. That's going to make them much stronger in terms of their relationship with you from a cultivation perspective. Um, and then you want to think about engagement opportunities. I talked about tours. You want to make sure that if you're having major events, you invite them to things. If you're having open engagements where people are able to see the impact of your work, there's nothing wrong with sending a text or sending a call to somebody and say, hey, we're having this camp program next week. You should come on down. Or there's this thing that the kids are the kids are having their debate next week. We need a judge. Will you come and be a judge at our debate? Whatever those things are in that process, try and think about the ways that you can engage the folks that you think are potential significant donors to the work that you're doing um, or connectors to where you're going. So now you've treated them like a person, built a relationship with them, included them in kind of the vision of where you're trying to go. You put them or at least given them opportunities to be boots on the ground in terms of what you're doing. And now they're really like part of your family, right? They're connected to what you're doing. They're connected to where you're going. And now this is hopefully when people start to open their Rolodex. And so I'm, I made the joke about Oprah and Bill Gates earlier. If I had a dollar for every time I've heard that in my philanthropic career, I'd have a lot of money. Um, but what we really talk about in most instances, except for people like Oprah and Bill Gates, most people's co major contribution to you is actually their network and the people that they know and the access and the doors that they can open to you is more than the check that they can write. And this is even for people that are able to write five, 10, 25, 50, $100,000 checks. The people that are in those kind of circles are part of the LA club, the beach club, the Jonathan club. They are connected to other business owners and business leaders. They can help you transform your board and the connections that you have. Um, we often recommend people hosting small donor events, right? So 
what does this mean? Ho hosting an event that invites 10 to 15 donors that come in at the same time, maximum. This is a small intimate event. You have a client or a family or a child speak at that event. It gives you a chance to get to know every single person there. You really have one anchor donor or one anchor board member or two that are hosting that and you ask them to invite other people to this, right? And so if you've done the first three steps in this process of treating someone like a relationship, having them be invested, giving them premium engagement opportunities, then they're gonna know that you can bring a client in that's gonna tell a really good story. They're going to want to invite their friends down to showcase what you're doing because they are gonna feel like they're part of what you're doing, right? Anybody that has a sense of pride about what that looks like. Think of it as like an aunt or an uncle inviting people to come and see their like niece or nephews play, right? They didn't help that. It's probably very unlikely that they did most of the work of getting that child into being an opportunity to be able to do that. But they're still very proud of that moment. They're going to share it with other people. They're going to talk about it on social media. You want to create the same environment with your donors. So you've developed this relationship with them. Now you put them in a small event opportunity. Now you can open their network. Maybe they bring three people with them and then you start the cycle all over again, right? Now you have three new people to build new relationships with. You share, get them to be shared and invested. Maybe they join the same committee that individual donor is on. So now you've transformed your event committee or a program committee or whatever that looks like. Now they're invested. Now they're engaged. Now they invite their net group, group of friends are not all going to be the same. They're going to invite a few other people, maybe that they work with or that are in their network. And then you rinse and repeat that process. Um, so uh, thinking of donors as as people and as more than just their checks are the thing that is is really going to go a long way in this process. Um, the next slide I have is for Q and A, but I'll just close out really quickly because of the way some of these questions were were worded. Were particularly around how to ask people or an individual target that you want to ask for money, kind of what the preparation of that looks like. Ninety percent of the work is what we talked about during this presentation. It is the development of the relationship with them. It's getting them in a position to say yes to a phone call or a coffee. It's understanding the way and the place and the thing that they wanna get. The next thing that you wanna do is identify the level that you wanna have them come in at and what that's gonna look like. And then you really wanna narrow that down then. And once you've kind of narrowed that slice down to kind of whatever that looks like, get in front of them, have that engagement, make sure that they know you're gonna make an ask beforehand. There's nothing wrong with saying, I wanna talk about your contribution this upcoming year. Let them know that, that that's the conversation you're going to have. Make the ask of whatever it is that you want to ask them for, and then you leave that donor in that situation to then be the person to make the next step. You just ask, hey, Sharon, we're really looking for a $500 gift this year. We know you gave $500 last year. It would be really productive for us to do X. And then you just, and then you just let Sharon answer. Because in that instance, at that point, and all you can do is give them a reason not to give. You have now made your ask. You've made your case. You've been building this relationship for the entirety of a year. You put it in front of them. And it's now their opportunity to say they either want to engage or they don't. Yo, these hours go by so fast. I know that was jam packed for everybody. Donor cultivation, I feel like is also a year long process all along with fundraising. I mean, each of these segments are so different. So I hope everybody takes the opportunity and definitely goes back and watches this recording because Jordan, you definitely dropped some gems for everybody. This was fantastic information. So I'm so glad it's recorded. I'll be sure to share this with anyone. Any final last questions before we close out today? We are at the hour, so I want to respect everybody's time. Any last questions while we've got Jordan on here? Um, last question. Uh, maybe benchmarking. Uh, how do you know how you're doing in fundraisers in comparisons to other similar orgs? There's, I, I really don't like benchmarking to other organizations because you don't know the situation and the ways that they've accomplished what they've accomplished. But really what you should be thinking about is the number of major donors that you feel like are within your realm and within your pool. So organizations that have a board of a hundred people, that doesn't exist, but well, there are some that are kind of crazy like that. But if you have a really big board that's really engaged, they're going to have more donors than you do. And their budget might be the same size as yours. And there's no way for you to have any sense of that. Um, so thinking about it as we have, think of it as a pyramid is really the way we try and think about it. You have, I want to be getting 50 donors at this level, or we think we can get 50 donors at this level, 25 at this level, 10 at this level, and one at this level, or whatever that might look like. Set those goals for yourself and then set yourself up to network and co have conversations to lead into giving you those opportunities in the process.
Awesome. Okay. Y'all, thank you so much. I put the, let me put it again in the chat, but I put the Your Mission Possible. Um, and Jordan, we didn't even really get to dive into that. So we'll have to do another lunch and learn with you to go over that one. But I'm going to put Jordan's website in the chat box for those of you uh, that do want to check it out and get more information. Um, he's very approachable. Jordan, I can't thank you enough for joining today and helping coaching and just loving on us with so much information. Other than that, we will be back on, I believe, March 6th. And we will be talking about sponsorships, uh, round number two, sponsorships for nonprofit organizations. So be sure you sign up for March 6th and keep an eye out on your inbox. We'll send out the recording. I hope everyone has a fantastic week. Thanks for joining our Lunch and Learn.